there is no denying the visceral presence of evil in the world. C.S. Lewis wrote, we will admit we can ignore even pleasure, but pain insists upon being attended to. God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. Evil and its auxiliary manifestations, pain and suffering, are realities that intrude upon the lives of everyone at some point in his or her existence. The question is, what or who best explains the presence of evil in the world? If this is your first time here, make sure and hit the subscribe button and click that bell so that you never miss a video or an interview. Our goal is to help you enter into a confirmed, confident, and eternal relationship with the source of all life and purpose. Now, I need to point out that evil comes in many forms, and therefore the problem of evil has many forms as well. There's the religious problem of evil. There's the problem of natural evil. There's the evidential problem of evil. There's questions surrounding moral evil. And so here we're only going to focus on moral evil. And I hope to give you at least one avenue through which to understand this difficult issue. By no means will this cease the debate. But my hope is that it will add at least another hopefully helpful layer. Many philosophers have pondered why, if God exists, would he allow humans to engage in the cruelty to which they are at times inclined? Many atheists assert that the morally reprehensible acts of individuals in the Holocaust or chattel slavery, for example, are proof that God does not exist because he did not prevent those actions. Even within Christianity, there exists a range of perspectives on what role God plays in his knowledge of and ability to prevent moral evil. But for now, I just want to offer one idea, the idea that Molinism can offer to help us understand this issue. Molinism, especially as updated by Alvin Plantinga in God, Freedom, and Evil. It is consistent in explaining why God might allow moral evil to exist. So moral evil is a problem precisely because it affects every human at some point in their lives. This could come in the form of being lied to, beat, cheated on, defrauded, at the very worst, maimed or killed. And included within this thought is that often there is evil present in each individual to varying degrees, which Plenica referred to as transworld depravity. N.T. Wright wrote, but nor must we suppose that the problem of evil can be either addressed or solved if we trivialize it in the other way of labeling some people good and other people bad. Acknowledging the presence of evil is the first step to understanding how best to deal with its impact. Once the problem of moral evil is granted, one can then begin to postulate the reasons for its existence. However, it is at this point that one's presuppositions begin to present themselves. So some who may postulate a best possible world scenario view the current world as falling far short of that lofty ideal. Some perceive that evil is necessary in order to affect some greater good. And while others view moral evil as so unacceptable that to correlate it with the idea of an omnipotent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God is impossible. Others such as Augustine view evil as a degradation of goodness. Augustine wrote, where is evil then and whence and how crept it in hither? What is its root, what its seed, or hath it no being at all? In the city of God, he also wrote, for evil has no positive nature. What we call evil is merely the lack of something that is good. Adams also captures the issue well when they write, should one see evils as a challenge, the overcoming of which adds zest to life in a basically good world? Or should one see life as nightmarish, far beyond human powers to affect? Should one endure it with stoic resignation, doing what one can to ease the pain? Or should one rebel against it in fierce opposition? Listen, there is no escaping the lived experience of moral evil, which requires both the theist and the atheist to offer compelling and philosophically consistent explanations as to the origin, purpose, and nature of moral evil. Now, at this point, I want to introduce some people who may not be familiar to Luis de Molina, who was a 16th century Spanish theologian. His most notable contribution to theology was explaining the concept of divine middle knowledge. Middle knowledge helps us understand the nuance that should exist between, let's say, Calvinism and Armenianism. 
Molina demonstrated how his theory was rooted in scripture, but more importantly, it explained the relationship between God's sovereignty and human free will. He posited that there are, in essence, three levels of God's knowledge. The first level is natural knowledge. So God is the only independent, non-contingent being, and therefore, since he himself is necessary in order for anything else to exist, he has knowledge of all necessary truths by knowledge of his own nature. The second level is free knowledge. So this knowledge speaks to the fact that God has complete knowledge of the future. Lang writes, as Molina states, it is by his free knowledge that he knows absolutely and determinately without any condition or hypothesis, which ones from among all the contingent states of affairs were in fact going to obtain and likewise, which ones were not going to obtain. Now, the third type of knowledge that God does possess is middle knowledge. This involves the concept of counterfactuals, which is a statement of how things would definitely be if things had gone differently. In essence, God knows what someone might choose given a certain state of affairs, but he in no way causes him or her to choose a certain option. Craig writes, the counterfactuals are contingently true. S could freely decide to refrain from A action in C circumstances so that different counterfactuals could be true and be known by God than those that are. Hence, although it is essential to God that he have middle knowledge, it is not essential to him to have middle knowledge of those particular propositions that he does in fact No. Now, libertarian free will fits securely in the realm of middle knowledge and free will, as will be shown, provides the potential to choose between a range of options, some of which may involve morally evil actions. And I should say a range of options consistent with one's nature. In order to provide a method of assessing the reasons why God would allow moral evil to exist, I'm putting forth the following proposition. So in order for true love to exist, God must create free creatures with the potential to commit moral evil. Additionally, free creatures with the potential to love and commit moral evil do exist. Now, even atheists would likely not disagree with premise two. Uh, The more contentious premise of proposition is the first one. But premise one rests upon the idea that God, being omnibenevolent, would seek to desire both for himself and for the creatures, in this case humans, that he creates to maintain the ability to achieve the highest ethic, which is love. But listen to this. Love that is not freely given can never be trusted. A prerequisite for true love is that when one professes love to another, they are doing so of their own volition. Louis de Molina, amongst others, noticed this reality. McGregor writes, likewise, gratia cuperans, cooperating grace, was no longer Aquinas' divine empowerment to perform spiritual good whereby a person progressed on the track toward justification. Rather, for Molina, it became the spirit engendered disposition of the regenerate person's soul to do the will of God and serve others. This disposition made the greatest joy and deepest desire of believers to carry out Jesus' two great commandments, to love God maximally and to love neighbor as oneself. So let me give an example to help clarify this. So suppose a woman loves a man and desires that he love her back as well. And then suppose to achieve this result, she places him in a cage and encourages him to say, I love you. And next, suppose she attaches electrodes to that cage so that every time the man responds, he's jolted with electricity whenever he touches the cage. And when he's shocked, she casually implies, all you have to do is say, I love you, and it will stop. The man seeking self-preservation may eventually succumb to her wishes and respond with, I love you. However, even though she receives the satisfaction of the words, she'll never be able to know if he meant what he said. Likewise, if God were to alleviate humans of their libertarian free will, he would never be able to trust any I love you, Lord, that he received. The unfortunate reality is that in order for humans to possess libertarian free will, they must be free to engage in all actions, including morally evil actions. Free will hampered by external parameters, even by God, ceases to be free will. In fact, an unlikely source helps us to define libertarian free will in this sense. Former atheist Anthony Flew writes, This is the sense in which the point of saying that someone acted freely is not to bring out that he did not do what he did under constraint, but to imply that there were no contingently sufficient non-subsequent conditions for his choosing to act in this particular way and no other. Libertarian free will necessitates the ability to choose freely between a range of options where each option is compatible with the nature of that particular creature. In other words, 
Libertarian free will should not be expressed by asserting that a human being can choose to create a universe or not to create one. God, however, does have these options because it is within his nature and ability. So the idea that God exists and that he would allow moral evil to exist are not contradictory. Now, I know everyone's not going to agree with that. There have been and will most likely continue to be some detractors. J.L. Mackey believes that the mere existence of evil is enough to disavow any notions of an omnipotent, omnibenevolent God. He writes, in its simplest form, the problem is this. God is omnipotent, God is wholly good, and yet evil exists. There seems to be some contradiction between these three propositions. So that if any two of them were true, the third would be false. So Mackey thinks that if God were truly good, he would want to eliminate evil. And if God were truly all powerful, he would have the ability to eliminate evil. However, this objection makes several presuppositional errors, which will later be dealt with in detail. But for now, one should note that if God desires humans to be free so that they have the potential to love, that very freedom has consequences. And although that freedom may lead to evil actions, it is a necessary byproduct of freedom being allowed. William Rowe objects to the nature of moral evil as well, and he would concede that even if evil had to exist on some level, it's unnecessary for God to allow the intense suffering that's witnessed on this earth unless it could be shown that some greater good is brought about by such suffering. So Rowe writes, of course, if the intense suffering leads to some greater good, a good we could not have obtained without undergoing the suffering in question, we might conclude that the suffering is justified, but it remains an evil nevertheless. However, Rowe is not able to clarify what is meant by intense, nor how a finite man or woman could ever come to know if there are goods beyond his or her knowledge, which God could still bring into reality. Furthermore, it's not beyond reason to see that there are goods that might justify God in allowing a certain moral evil to come to be. The fact that one or me or whoever does not know why God would allow such moral evil cannot lead necessarily to the conclusion that God has no reason. That would be an argument from ignorance. Additionally, I once heard Abdu Murray say that if you can figure out everything about your God, that's not the God to worship. Jacques-Marie Louis Monsabre said, if God would concede me his omnipotence for 24 hours, you would see how many changes I would make in the world. But if he gave me his wisdom too, I would leave things as they are. I agree. Listen, we can have sufficient knowledge without having exhaustive knowledge. Feinberg summarizes David Bassinger's analysis of Rowe's argument in this way. Basinger claims that it ultimately rests on a belief that an omnipotent, omniscient, holy good God could have done better. And this seems to be where many atheistic arguments from evil eventually culminate. Most recently, the new atheists represented by Richard Dawkins, Samuel Harris, Daniel Dennett, and the late Christopher Hitchens have engaged in the debate addressing God's morality and the presence of moral evil. And most of their work has been to prove that God does not exist, but that if he does exist, he is not great or deserving of worship. They also spend a fair amount of writing indicating that God is not necessary in order to justify what is good. However, none of this explains why there is so much moral evil present in the world, nor does it help us find a remedy. I think there is one fundamental flaw that is prevalent in almost all atheistic arguments, which is that they miss the forest for the trees. One's inability to understand why God might allow moral evil in any amount does not negate God's existence. Once again, disagreement does not prove non-existence. This is especially true if there exists positive evidence which affirms God's existence, such as the cosmological or teleological arguments. Feinberg writes, Hence, anyone who uses an inductive argument like Rowe's argument against theism must offer a good reason apart from evil's existence for believing that God doesn't exist. Therefore, if evidence is presented that God does exist, which much of the recent historical and scientific evidence seems to suggest, the best that the atheist could do is say that God exists, but I don't like him. In answering Sam Harris's theory of morality evolving with and through macroevolutionary processes, biochemist Michael Behe responds, the unanticipated discovery of layers of control, master switches, and the stunningly sophisticated genetic regulatory networks they activate does not make the putative, undirected development of 
life any easier to explain. Evo Devo, or evolutionary developmental biology, enthusiasts seem to imagine. It makes it harder. See, the need for a foreman and subcontractors to coordinate construction does not make it easier to explain how unintelligent processes could make a building out of bricks and wood and pipes and wiring. It shows it to be impossible. So Behe is signifying that in order to arrive at the sort of biological evolution that Harris is avowing there would need to be an external infusion of data and parts. The best and only candidate for that sort of intrusion is God. And that's one of the many reasons that an increasing number of biologists, chemists, and physicists see evidence for God's existence. Now, Mackey suggested that an all-powerful and all-good God could and would eliminate evil. However, that assumes how a good God would decide to use his power. For example, a man may love his children and therefore would desire that they love him in return. He likely has the power to force them to do whatever he wants them to do. However, once he attempts to force them to love him, he actually subverts his own desire. Forced love will never equate to true love. Therefore, an all-powerful God could choose to divulge himself of some power in order to allow these creatures he creates to freely enter into the relationship he desires to have with them. However, even if he does not divulge himself of some of his power in the sense of him not forcing creatures to do what they should do, it does not necessarily follow that he could not do so if he decided to. And this is really all that has to be shown in order to defeat the atheist objection about what an omnibenevolent or omnipotent God would do. Molina writes in his commentaria, future contingents are really able not to be. Otherwise, they would not really be future contingents. Thus, they are really able not to be such that God knows that they are going to occur. In fact, it involves a contradiction for them to be so known by God and yet already existed before. And the power to eliminate the relation to such an object, a relation that had also existed previously. So Melina is saying that God's foreknowledge does not impede or negate the possibility of his middle knowledge. And in this way, God remains sovereign, but allows human beings to have the freedom to choose future actions. It is not that God cannot know those actions or force those actions. It is that he is not directing or choosing to guide those actions towards a certain end. And Alvin Planica, who built his free will defense on the same kind of underlying presuppositions that Molina arrived at, helps clarify how libertarian free will is intertwined with God's will. He writes, what is relevant to the free will defense is the idea of being free with respect to an action. If a person is free with respect to an action, then he is free to perform that action and free to refrain from performing it. If I know you well, I may be able to predict what action you will take in response to a certain set of conditions. It does not follow that you are not free with respect to that action. Additionally, scripture indicates that each person has the ability to choose or exercise libertarian free will in the moral decisions that they make. And these are some passages for reference, which would imply that in regards to moral evil, one is choosing to miss God's standard of holiness. Now, Roe alluded to the need to have a greater good in order to maintain a justification for suffering, especially intense suffering. However, that terminology may be incorrect. Free will simply necessitates the potential for moral evil to exist. Libertarian free will is not a greater good per se, although some may classify it as such, but rather free will is a necessary condition in order for God to actualize love amongst humans and himself. Scripture indicates that God loves humanity and gave his son for their sake, that God is the embodiment of love, and that God desires that people love him and love one another. Every indication in scripture suggests the fact that God is relational. Furthermore, love is only possible in relationships. For a relational God to actualize a world in which libertarian free will and thereby the potential for moral evil did not exist would undermine his very nature and essence. Copan writes, Rather, God seeks the interpersonal intimacy with us in the context of covenant making Critics typically paint the picture of two false alternatives, sovereign coercion or total human autonomy. However, if we see God's activity in human nature as harmonious rather than in conflict, a new perspective dawns on us. When God's intentions for us are realized and when we're alert to the divinely given boundaries built into our nature and the world around us, we human beings flourish. That is, we enjoy loving, trusting relationships with God and one another because we're living out the design plan. In addressing the problem of evil, Roe and other atheists have missed the very nature and heart 
of God. Copan continues, so for God to block the possibility of our knowing him would actually be to deprive us of the greatest possible good. The goal of God is love in relationship with humans, which means that sometimes moral evil will present itself as a byproduct of the freedom necessary for that love to exist. Rowe's argument in particular attempts to reduce a metaphysical reality, which is love, to the theorems and postulations that he puts forth. Now, Plantinga responds to Rowe's attempt to use Bayes' theorem to prove his hypothesis correct by using Bayes' theorem in reverse to prove the efficacy of the free will defense. Feinberg notes, the result is that now, using Bayes' theorem, we have an argument that shows that theism is more probable than not. Since this argument is relevantly similar to Rose, Plantinga believes we can see this as a counterbalancing argument to Rose. Neither God nor the knowledge he possesses can be reduced to formulas, but his desire for love can become evident to anyone who can supersede his antagonism to the notion of moral evil. From the beginning, God gave humans free will. That ability to choose undergirded their ability to be obedient. Love always requires a sacrifice of the will to some degree. Based on Mark 7, 8 through 23, Molina thought God gave the Israelites the dietary commands in order that they would internalize the conceptual difference between the clean and the unclean in the moral realm, not because certain foods were unethical to eat in and of themselves. In other words, moral choice was the goal. God wanted to teach the Israelites how best to make moral choices. Inherent within that concept is the ability for each individual Israelite to have the capacity to choose between a range of options that would be compatible with his or her nature. The very fact that morality must be learned implies that any form of divine determinism was not within God's ultimate desire. For the Christian God, that would not be the best possible world. Contrary to the best possible world theory of Wilhelm Leibniz, Plantinga offers that there does not exist a best possible world that God could have actualized. Because of God's desire to create free creatures, there are sets of affairs that even an omnipotent God could not create. Therefore, Plantinga referred to this as Leibniz's lapse. Plantinga writes, The free will defender, you recall, insists on the possibility that it is not within God's power to create a world containing moral good without creating one containing moral evil. His atheological opponent, Mackey, for example, agrees with Leibniz in insisting that if, as a theist holds, God is omnipotent, then it follows that he could have created any possible world he pleased. We now see that this contention, call it Leibniz's lapse, is a mistake. The atheologian is right in holding that there are many possible worlds containing moral good but no moral evil. His mistake lies in endorsing Leibniz's lapse. So one of his premises that God, if omnipotent, could have actualized just any world he pleased is false. Eight theologians will continue to assert that God could have arranged the state of affairs differently. However, Molinism, which entails free will, provides an epistemically sound method for explaining why God would or could allow a state of affairs where moral evil is possible. Furthermore, middle knowledge explains how it would be possible for God to actualize free creatures whose actions he does not 100% divinely determine. Lastly, the love that God desires provides adequate explanation as to why God would allow such a state of affairs where moral evil was possible. Moral evil is addressed repeatedly throughout scriptures. God consistently warns individuals, nations, and tribes not to engage in moral evil. Those warnings and the preceding judgments indicate that moral evil being addressed either preventively or in judgment was a free choice of those people or groups. No one could be held accountable for something that one did not freely choose to do. However, moral evil is not God's goal, love is. True love requires choice and relationship. Molinism and Plantinga's free will defense provide clarity regarding the necessary mechanism of libertarian free will, which is indispensable in order to actualize God's highest priority, love. Now, I'm aware that everyone won't agree with this take. And to my Christian brothers and sisters, let's keep it that way. Let's remain brotherly and in community and in fellowship and in love, regardless of how you see the best way to reconcile the problem of moral evil. But feel free to leave a comment and I will try to engage with as many of you in your perspectives as possible, as long as they're respectful. Make sure and check out these videos as well on the nature and the essence of God. Until next time, be blessed. Peace. <laughs>